want to welcome everyone to service today, uh, not only those that are here, but those that are watching on Facebook Live and join us uh, uh, on that behalf. But it's good to see all of you here today. We've got folks coming in, and we're just pleased, pleased, pleased to see back. Uh, we appreciate you all. And let me tell you something that we talked about the other night. You folks take any pew you want to take at that, that is open, and our choir has committed to me that if we need seats, that we got seats right behind me right here. So, true? Amen. So, we're fine. We got area up here. So, one of the concerns we had, we don't want anyone coming in this building as our people begin to come back to feel uncomfortable. Uh, and you say, I don't want to get anybody's seat. You will not get someone's seat because we don't have a seat. You sit anywhere you want to sit, and uh, we will sit up here. I'll tell you what, it would fire me up if these front pews were full. Uh, and, you know, a lot of our folks think there's snakes on them or something. Uh, I mean, they will not sit there. But uh, I'll tell you, you sit anywhere you want. And uh, last week, uh, we saw people coming back and still do. And we want you to feel comfortable. We want you to feel safe. And we want you to feel welcome. But you know what we want you to feel more than anything? Dolores, you commented on this in a sermon I preached recently. We want you to feel the Spirit. So uh, welcome. Good to see you guys. Uh, it is. And uh, I was telling Holly the other night, I said, you're going to meet people you've never met before as this uh, began. And uh, it's, uh, uh, we've got new family uh, uh, back here, a couple of new families uh, that's come into our church since this all been going on. So who can tell what God might do? Amen. You never know, do you? But it's great to be here today, and we love you, we appreciate you, and we want you to feel at home in God's house. And this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you mean to us. We just praise you for everything that you mean. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We tried something other night, Roger. You've not forgot what we tried, have you? Uh, we're going to have four song leaders this morning, Gladys, Roger, Carla, and myself. Stand right across here, and you'll be looking at our back. So come on up, guys. We're going to sing some new songs that we practice.
morning, and uh, what I feel led to do is ask the choir uh, to turn to page 84 in our special, uh, in our music we're singing out of. And I want all of you to stand, and we're going to sing, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. And I want to instill in the hearts of every individual that's here today that we're not here to be seen, we're not here to be uh, lifted up, we're here to lift him up, and we're here to lift up his name and to encourage. Uh, the Sunday school lesson today is that we should encourage one another. Let me tell you something you may have never thought of. You may have never thought of this, but you have to have courage to encourage. A lot of us don't encourage because we're afraid we'll get hurt, get harmed. We're afraid of things like that. But it takes a godly courage to encourage others. You cannot encourage anyone if you don't have courage. You've got to stand up and say, I want to make your life better. I want to make you stronger. And I want to give you more courage, the same courage I have. And uh, we're going to sing uh, this morning uh, a song that's our sole uh, divine purpose for being here today. And that is, brethren, we have met to worship. And I want to ask you this morning, I know we can't have our, uh, some of the things we normally have, our fellowship, we can't have our prayer circle. But you know, it made me realize how many things we can have and how much we can do. And, uh, you know, during this time, we have been able to reach people from multiple states all over the nation, all the way out west. Uh, we had somebody send in, uh, Tim, one night somebody texted us on that board, said, I'm in the Mojave Desert, and I'm watching you all. I never dreamed anybody to hear me preach uh, uh, in a desert, you know, in Arizona, all the way Utah. We've had people during this uh, uh, transition and during this time. Uh, we could call it a challenge. But you know, I hear a little proverb uh, one time. It said, opportunity knocks at the least opportune moment. And you know, opportunity is knocking today. And we got people, we got a, a wall full of people watching back there this morning and sharing it. And we got people asking them for prayer requests. And we've got people, uh, I'm just reminding you, I'm looking at that board, and I, I know a lot of folks through funerals and things like that over the years. We've got people from Illinois watching this morning, and people from Florida, I saw this key in, and people from Corbin. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Caught you off guard, didn't it? Uh, from uh, all over the place. So, uh, therefore, let's uh, just worship the Lord. This is not a complicated song. It's a very easy song. And our choir this morning has so courageously stood up and uh, weathered the storm. And uh, we have seen uh, at times that it was a little bit scary. But I'll tell you what, we're here today. So let's sing this song. Uh, and we're going to... I sing all four verses of it, and then after that, our choir can uh, disassemble. Is that the right word to use? That's a bad word to use in church. Disassemble. <laughs> Reassemble. Okay. Reassemble wherever they want to sit and wherever they're comfortable to be. But we're so happy to have you here today. So we're going to sing, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. This is an old song. Class usually tells me how old they are, but she don't know on this and this. Why? Yeah, <laughs> before numbers are ever invented. So let's sing this, and uh, you uh, you join us if you know it.
You know, I love that song. Uh, did, you, uh, did you all notice the latter part of the last verse of that Christ himself will gird himself and serve us? In the book of Revelation at the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, the Bible tells us, Brother Jim, that Christ will gird himself and he'll serve us. So will that not be? Wow. Will that not be something? You know, he tells us to love each other and serve one another. But uh, the, John the Revelator, uh, you know, and I use a little uh, little clip from time to time. I said they sent uh, John out on the Isle of Patmos, uh, and that was the island for Christian refugees and Christian uh, prisoners as well. And uh, John was out on that island, and, and God uh, told John, said, why don't you write a book and call it Revelation? And John said, I might. He said, you can write a book, can't you? And John said, I wrote two or three already. Oh, <laughs> uh, you Bible scholars, where are you at this morning? Where are you at today? Okay, uh, praise the Lord for being here today. And, uh, you know, uh, I love that song. And we love you guys. And I'll tell you, as I look back this morning, uh, I'm going to say one word, and that is wow. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for being part of the service. We appreciate you. We love you. And we're just uh, glad you're here. Michael, why don't you come sing a song after you do that? Then uh, I'll bring the message. Let me remind you of what I'm doing this morning in the sermon. God uh, told me I listened to the Spirit to go get one of my Bibles that I have put back. I don't know about Jim and others and Michael, but I've got seven or eight Bibles I preach all of. And the reason I change is that I've used them so much I can't see to read them. So he told me to go get one, and I'm going to preach a sermon that I preached on a Sunday night way back when, right here at Oak Grove. And... Uh, I'll share it with you uh, in just a moment. But uh, God told me to go back. I, I seldom ever do that. Have you noticed that? Seldom ever go back. Uh, I'll go back to a text because you can't wear a text out, but I seldom ever go back to a particular sermon and preach it. But uh, that's what I'm going to do this morning. And I'll give you the text in a minute. Some of you said, why don't you give it to us now? I don't remember where it said, okay? So I have been humble this morning. <laughs> okay, Michael, come on. The 
first just want to say I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, today's a good day. I'm thankful for every opportunity, for everything that God's done for me. Um, I hope that you can sometimes stop in your life and realize everything that God has done for you. Um, you know, in the end of John, I believe, it says that if there had been all the things that have been done by Jesus have been wrote down, I don't believe that the books of the world could contain uh, what Jesus did. Exactly. The world cannot hold the books, thank you, <laughs> that if it was to contain what Jesus did. Um, and you know, that's the same thing with our lives. We can't com- even begin to understand what God has done for us. Um, you just can't. And whenever, you, if you truly just sit down and think about it, and you start thanking God for everything that he's done, you might be sitting there for a pretty long time. Because if we're all honest with ourselves, we know that God's been good. So... Oh, I'm a traveler Far from home I get lost But I press on Cause there's a mansion In streets of gold Where I belong Yes, there's a day coming soon Where the old will be made new And heaven's glory shines like the morning before I When we all see Jesus When we all see Jesus No more sickness No more madness No more pain When we all See Jesus face to face. Then we will sing with angel voices. There will be a great rejoicing. Well, holy, holy, worthy, worthy the Lamb. When we all see Jesus, yes, when we all see Jesus, no more sickness, no more madness, no more pain. When we all see Jesus face to face. When we all see Jesus face to face. Thank you, Michael. One day we're going to see the Lord face to face. Uh, Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. He said, now we know in part and see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, and we shall know even as we are known. Uh, you know, I really appreciate Michael. Uh, one thing he said, he said, if all the good things Christ had done, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of books in the world, Michael, 
but there's a lot of space left after you <laughs> stack all the books up, right? And what he said was, he said uh, that uh, I suppose that the world cannot hold the books that should be written, and you can never write enough. The poet cannot uh, pen it. Uh, the art, artistic designer cannot, uh, cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, make it how that it should be. Uh, but only God. I'm in uh, Second Kings. I'm in Second Kings this morning. Uh, chapter number five. I preached a sermon here at Oak Grove a few, uh, several months ago, maybe a, a few years back, uh, titled Pomp and Circumstance. Now, uh, in that and in that title, uh, Pomp and Circumstance was a movie, I believe, and uh, at one time, and what it does, Second Kings chapter five, it's in the Old Testament, uh, so that's a good place to start, okay? Um, I'm just trying to cheer you up a little bit, okay? And uh, Second Kings chapter 5, and uh, pomp and circumstance means uh, uh, that that's when it, something happens, a circumstance, and it is celebrated, but it's celebrated in great array. In other words, it is just uh, blasted out there. In other words... A lot of times people will do that. We today would call it a parade. We today would call it a celebration. We today would call it a festive time. Uh, but in the story that I'm going to read, I'm going to read verse number uh, 10 and verse number 11 is where I'm going to take the text, but I'll be touching back on some things in it. And I want you to keep in mind uh, the uh, title of the sermon, Pomp and Circumstance. Pomp is a festive time, and the circumstance is uh, a place to be grow in this text today. In verse number 10, and Elisha said unto the messenger, uh, said, sent a messenger unto him. This is a prophet, prophet Elisha, and uh, he sent a messenger unto Naaman, and he said, Go wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again. To thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and he went away, and he said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leprosy, or my leprosy, or my, my illness. And uh, what's happening here now? I mean, uh, I was raised in the country. I just look at things in a simple fashion. Uh, if I walk in the yard and dog bites me and I go back again, Roger, I, I sort of figure he'll probably bite me again, you know. I just look at things fundamentally and simple, and a lot of times that's what we need to do. It seems so simple to me when the prophet Elisha said, Naaman had asked a question, what do I need to do to be cured of leprosy? Nobody couldn't cure leprosy, could they? Uh, they could not cure it. Uh, but he thought that God could, uh, apparently, or he would have not come there. And he asked, what must I do to be clean? And he said, go dip seven times uh, in Jordan. I could illustrate that today, One uh, once down and once up, twice down, twice up. It wouldn't take me but a moment to get to seven. Uh, but uh, notice here uh, that Naaman uh, had a characteristic that was uh, not pleasing to God. He did not want to, uh, first of all, humble himself to God, and second of all, he didn't want to follow God's direction. Uh, in the Sunday school, it was quoted Romans 10 and 9, If thou wilt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Simple as it can be, fundamental, uh, just a primary, easy uh, to comprehend belief that uh, uh, the instructions was clear, the directions was clear. Uh, the river was specific, was it not? And uh, the prophet had said it, and he said that God told him to say it, and Naaman, Naaman understood it, but Naaman decided not to obey God. And uh, the title of the sermon is Pomp, P-O-M-P, and Circumstances. Have you ever been in a bad circumstance? Michael, bless it. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I said that I had a little prop that I wanted to share with you this morning. I've got a folder in my hand, and Jolene, from where you're sitting, can you tell what that says on the front of that folder? Okay, actually, no. Uh, we need a... <laughs> I'm not going, uh, it's got my name on the front of it. Now, when I turn it around, Jolene, can you see what's on the back of that? She can see that. There's nothing on it. All right. I'll help her out a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, the reason I did that is the fact that uh, a lot of us don't look at the Scripture the way that it is written and the way it is illustrated. Uh, Naaman was uh, a very devout man. He, he held a high position. He uh, had authority over a lot of people. He had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of prestige. He had a lot of stuff going on. And uh, I just praise the Lord for that, and I thank God for that, and I'm just glad that uh, we're able to uh, uh, have a story like this in the Bible. But where the uh, pomp and circumstance comes in, when Naaman went to uh, be healed, you know, most people that are sick or most people that have cancer, and I've had cancer twice, uh, but most people that have, they humble themselves. Uh, they uh, feel like that they uh, uh, need to be humble before God. Uh, but you know where the pop comes in, Ed, and I want you to see this very, very clearly. Uh, where the pop comes in, Ed, we find that uh, uh, Naaman, when he came uh, to uh, the prophet Elisha, he did not come in a humble fashion. He came in a festive and uh, celebrative way. I believe with all my heart that when he came and uh, approached the, pro uh, the prophet Elisha, I believe with all my heart that he came uh, uh, to that and he had the chariots, he had uh, the horsemen out in front of him with shields and spears, he had uh, chariots that... Uh, accompanied him and he had on his festive uh, uh, garments and festive array he did not come to God like most of us or even like the Bible brother Michael tells us that we should approach God uh, the Bible tells us very clearly if we'll humble ourselves before the mighty God uh, that he will lift us up uh, Naaman was in a dire, and this is where the circumstance comes in. Uh, Naaman was in a dire a circumstance. Have you and I ever been in a dire circumstance? Uh, no man could heal him. If money could have done it, he had it. Uh, if fame could have brought him out, uh, he had fame. He had all kinds of notoriety. Uh, kings knew his name, and uh, paupers knew his name. You could ask the homeless man on the street, and he'd know who Naaman was back in his homeland. Uh, you could ask one of the uh, uh, no, uh, notable people in the land, and they knew who Naaman was. Uh, there was no doubt that this man was an uh, honorable uh, uh, or a uh, uh, lifted up individual and when he came uh, to the prophet he came to the prophet with all the uh, festive array at uh, the chariots and all that and when he got there uh, his disappointment came when the circumstance changed now I use this and I asked Tammy what's on this side it's my name uh, what's on that side there's nothing uh, what I'm trying to illustrate is that it went from the pomp and circumstance of uh, Naaman uh, it went to the name of God and to the circumstance that God we do not come to God on our circumstance uh, we do not come to God on our uh, values and all Jolene, we don't come to God because we're great or because we're somebody. Uh, we come to God because we have a need. We have a need of God. And we believe in our mind and we should in our heart uh, that God can do what God uh, said he would do and what we need. Uh, there's no doubt that Naaman uh, had heard about God. Uh, there's no doubt that Naaman had heard stories about the prophet Elisha and uh, even Elijah, uh, Elijah 
uh, that he had heard about him. Uh, there's no doubt that he knew about the divine power of God. Uh, but the circumstance was not what God would have them to be. And you know, after preaching on this many, many times in uh, revivals and all, I remember preaching a revival one night at Him Your Baptist Church, and I titled it, or God titled it, Turn Around, Turn Around. Uh, there was circumstance that was keeping... I name him from coming to God. I can you see that today? I name him came in, and if you'd been sitting there, Tom, if you'd been sitting by the side of the road. And Naaman had come in with the chariots and all the ray and the soldiers and the guards and the servants and all, and him all leaned back in his chariot and uh, and all the wonder and uh, uh, and all uh, just uh, everything, the glamour and all. Uh, you would have said, "Wow, who is that?" Uh, but it wasn't about who Naaman was. It was about who God was that day. And you know, it usually is about who God is. And now let's go into the story about Naaman for a moment. Uh, there was a little maid, so it uh, started out uh, in this fashion, told uh, uh, her uh, boss or her uh, guardian in the castle uh, that I know a man that I can call on God, and I know a man when he calls on God, Master Naaman, uh, I can be healed. Uh, you know, it don't get any simpler than that. I'm going to preach on some things this morning that this story brings out. Uh, the first thing that I want to preach on uh, is the small maid great. It took a little maid, a little simple servant girl, a poor girl, a girl that didn't probably have any money, worked day by day, had nothing much at all. A lot of us know how that feels. I've been there. I've done that. I hit took something very small. Our Lord reminds us if we have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, that we can say to yonder's mountain, be ye therefore removed, and it'll be removed and cast into the sea. Uh, you know, this starts out with a very small thing. Uh, God don't need a great thing to do great things. Uh, we do. You know, if we went out and bought us a new Mercedes today, we'd need a great bank account. Uh, but God don't need great things to do great things. God uses small things to accomplish great things. And it is illustrated here. Uh, the little maid said, if I, the master name him would even call uh, Elisha. I want to remind you of something. Step one, I name him called Elisha. Uh, step one, he called Elisha. Uh, so he did that right. Uh, but listen to what happens after that. Not only did it take a simple thing to make great things happen, uh, but it uh, took, a, and I want you to really uh, notice this, it took a very simple instruction. If I said to one of you today, uh, if you wanted to be healed, and I said walk outside, touch that post, and come back, uh, that's very hard to misunderstand. Uh, you know, that's a very simple instruction. Uh, how many of you men have ever tried and tried and tried? One time we bought uh, our oldest daughter, Deb, a swing set. I spent a day and a half trying to put it together. And finally, Joyce come out there, Jolene, and said, you know, it does have instructions, you know. But we guys are not going to read the instructions, you know. We won't even look at a road sign. A man was driving down the road one day, and he said, I'm lost. I don't know where I'm at. And his wife's over there saying, right there's a sign. Uh, it tells you where you're at. Uh, you know, the instructions were simple. They were easily understood. They were uh, right there available, were they not? Uh, he didn't have to dig them up out of the dirt. He didn't have to search for them. He didn't have to, uh, now get this, folks. I know this is a, uh, don't sound like today's time, but he didn't have to Google them. All he had to do is listen to what 
of the prophet said. The little maiden, you know, God, I was telling our group the other night, uh, God works through people. Uh, Brother Jim, people will say, well, pastor, pastor, pastor. A pastor is a person, one person in the church. Uh, uh, pastors don't bring people, people bring people. Uh, that's the way it works. Sheep lead sheep. Uh, do they not? You know, I was telling them, you can take one old lost lamb and let him go down the path and a thousand will follow him, you know. Uh, that's where blind leading the blind came in. Uh, but listen, it started with a little maid in her mouth telling about the greatness of God, telling what God could do, telling how great God was, telling how God could heal. And it went on. To, uh, uh, she said, now he needs to go. I don't know how Naaman went about it. He probably sent a servant, you know, as many people as he had. He probably sent a servant and said, well, you go down there and ask to, uh, how I can get to see Elisha. They probably came back. I'm just uh, imagining that and said, Master Naaman, uh, he said to come on down. Is that not what God's saying today? All that God giveth me cometh to me, and all that cometh to me shall in no wise be cast out. Come unto me, ye that, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come take your yoke upon me and learn of me, and uh, my yoke upon thee and learn of me. And my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I believe it, Elisha said, Name and come on down. Uh, come on down. God has always welcomed people to come to him. Uh, that is not the problem in our life today. It's not that God does not roll out to welcome man. Now, Elisha didn't have no uh, uh, big uh, party to throw. He never had no vast amount of money. He never had no chariots, and he never had no servants. He never had nothing like that. Uh, but, you know, as uh, uh, Naaman approached, he uh, again, uh, now here's uh, step number two. Uh, Naaman didn't go in and ask Elisha himself what he needed to do. You know why? You know what gets in her way a lot of times is pride. Have you ever noticed that? Pride is what keeps everybody from coming to God. He didn't go in and ask Elisha. He sent a servant. How do you know, Brother Vernon? Uh, give me a break. I read it this morning to you, okay? He sent a servant in, and the servant came back out and said, he said that God said, why do we have to take second and third hand information? Why don't we ask God herself? Why don't we go to God herself? But the servant come back out and say, Master Elijah, he said to go dip in Jordan uh, seven times. Uh, the very instance that that servant said Jordan, it turned that leader off. You know, he said, why can't I? Okay, if he thought, why can't I? Why didn't he? I'm asking you. If he had leprosy and he uh, thought that God could heal it, Brother Kim, why didn't he? He said, why can't I go down to Damascus and, uh, and dip seven times? Prophet Elisha said, uh, well, there ain't nothing keeps you from going down there and step. Have, have at it, brother, and see how that turned out. Uh, go right ahead. He said, Damascus, the waters are clear. Uh, okay, I'm preaching on circumstance. Pomp and circumstance. The pomp said, I believe I'll go down to Damascus in the clear water. But the circumstance didn't warrant healing in Damascus. It warranted it healing in Jordan. Are you getting that? He said, go to Jordan and dip seven times. There was no promise. I won't throw something else in. Also, the instructions were simple. There was no promise uh, to Naaman until he came up the seventh time. Roger, he could have dipped six and a half times. He could have stayed down and drowned, or he could have come up six times, went home. He said, I'm tired of this stuff. I'm headed out. Well, what happened? Let's go down a step farther. Not only was it small, made great, and a simple, uh, with simple instructions, but it's the same plan God always uses. Coming to me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden. Uh, you know, people want to do it their way. There's never been a way but God's way. There never will be. I remember Burger King one time had this commercial, and he said, have it your way. I said, no, what the world's wanting today. Everybody wants to have it their way. Uh, but Burger King said, have it your way. But when you come to God, uh, Naaman, John, uh, Naaman did not have it his way. 
He didn't have it his way. Let's go to John 14 and 6. I, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody come to the Father but by me. Uh, you can't have it your way. You've got to do it God's way. Uh, so notice here it's the same plan it's always been. It never changes. It never will. Uh, you know, uh, I worked with a man, and uh, uh, he couldn't uh, remember how to turn a boat in and out. And I pick at Jordan, my grandson, about this at times, but he couldn't uh, remember how to turn a boat or a screw, how to tighten it or loosen it. And I'd watch him, and uh, he... Uh, uh, this is a little scary, but he was a mechanic. But anyway, uh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, but the thing, uh, uh, a mechanic felt like a... Uh uh, be like me fixing your car uh, but uh, I'd, uh, I walked by him one day and he is saying righty tidy uh, loosey lefty and I thought okay uh, right is tight and loose is le uh, whatever you know I can't even remember that uh, but listen to what happened uh, there was not a problem uh, with the plan there was a problem with the man I'm going to say that again there was not a problem with the plan there was a problem with the man now listen to what happened when he comes see he shows up and then he decides to leave if God won't do it my way he must have been a Baptist I'm a telling you I love Baptist people but he had to be baptized into the Baptist church <laughs> uh, he said if I don't get it my way I'll just leave and you know what God told him? God said, bye-bye. See how that turned out. If I can't have it my way, I'll leave. Now, folks, uh, if you're a Bible scholar, you're with me this morning. Naaman said, I'll just leave. Uh, he popped in his chariot. I preached in a revival, turn around, turn around. You'll get that in a second. He jumped in his chariot, and he started down the road, and... One of the servants said, Master Naaman, don't you still have leprosy? I'm going to say that again. Don't you still have leprosy? Are you not leaving the same way you came here? You know what Naaman said? This is an old country boy speaking. Granny said, Turner around they pulled the ropes on that chariot and that chariot turned around the best decision Naaman ever made in his life when he decided to follow God's plan instead of his plan you know God's plan always works are y'all ready there's a lady at Poplar Grove Church back uh, uh, back in the 70s wrote a song buckle up your gospel seat belts because it's on the way so buckle up because I'm getting ready to tell you God's plan always work. works yours never has if man's plan had worked if the Pharisees and Sadducees could have figured it out Christ wouldn't have had to die for the sins of the world your plan has never worked and guess what? It never will. Never will. I can bring this book to court practice tonight, and I can uh, uh, try to find a word on here all day long. There ain't no songs on the back of here, honey. It's not going to happen. Naaman was trying to make something happen, but he won't do it his way. Okay, he had the small servant girl that... Get, made a great suggestion simple instructions and the same plan but now you know what my next preaching point is show time uh, Naaman come in and when he came up at road it was show time he came in and he uh, had leprosy and he wanted to see the prophet he wanted to hear from God he started to go back and he turned her around and he headed back again let me tell you something now it's show time. It's show time. Are y'all hearing me? It's show time. Naaman comes back and he uh, remember that when he came back there was no pomp. 
because he, uh, this time he is coming back as a man that had to be submissive to God, humble himself before God, follow God's direction, follow God's plan, and admit, God forbid that we admit we're wrong, admit that I was wrong. I admit it. And here he had to come back. Have you ever bought a ticket up at the Civic Center? Maybe Keston Crown's up there and it says admit one. I'll tell you what. Some of us would go in ultimate shock if we had to admit one. Naaman had to admit one. He had to say, I was wrong. So he pulls back in, same servants, same soldiers, same chariots, but there's no pomp. But now the circumstance has changed. Now God's in charge. It's no longer Naaman, the great captain of the army that's pushing everybody around, pushing their buttons, uh, firing them, having them, whatever. I don't know what all they did. But now it's showtime. But the show ain't about Naaman no more, Roger. It's about God. <laughs> It's about God. He pulls back in, and he probably gets out and says, Well, I decide to do it God's way. You know, and the old prophet Elijah hadn't changed the instructions at all. He said, Brother, go down there in Jordan and dip seven times. Why do we have to be told 50,000 times to do the same thing when that God told us the first time? He said, go down there to Jordan and dip seven times. Elisha hadn't changed the words. God hadn't changed the plan. And Jordan was still the same as murky as it had ever been. But Naaman did one thing right. Step number three. He did one thing right. He listened to the prophet that listened to God. You know, you hear people all the time say, I'm not listening to that preacher. I'm not listening to that singer. Well, I'll tell you what, if that person's listening to God, you better listen to that person or you're in a heap of trouble. So Naaman goes down and he starts dipping. I'm almost done the sermon, just so you all know. He starts dipping. There was a simple little girl made a great suggestion. There were simple instructions. Call, call or text Elisha. He knows what to do. You know, back then, they didn't have communication like we do. Is it not interesting, some of you, that we can't check on somebody, and we, we got, uh, I'm trying to think of all of it, we got Twitter and Facebook and text and calling. You know how... Only way we had to send you a message when I grew up is uh, write it and tape it around a rock and throw it through your window. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God said, Naaman, did you notice God didn't back away at all? Didn't change nothing. No. He didn't try to suit Naaman. Naaman, if you're enjoying your leprosy, you have a party. He didn't change nothing. And he very simply told Naaman again, you go and you dip seven times in Jordan. Now, we've had the small, make the great suggestion, the simple plan, simple instructions, same plan. We had show time, but now it's not Naaman's show. It's God's show. You know, man, things are smart right now, intelligent and brilliant and all of this. But do you realize that it's not a man's show in the future? It'll be God's show. I mentioned earlier in the book of Revelation, he said, Gird himself and serve us. There's nothing man can do to prevent or change anything. It's God's show. Now it's God's show. It's Naaman dips the seventh time and comes up. Now, I know him being the man he was, he drew a big crowd, big crowd. And people was looking, and they were watching. Do you realize when he went down the seventh time, he was still covered with leprosy? 
But when he come up the seventh time, the Bible says that he was healed. So my last point I made is it went from showtime to shouting time. Now you've got something to shout about. Have you ever noticed that when we leave it to God, everything always works out well? Have you ever noticed that? I know these preachers can tell you. Uh, when I first started preaching, I, I thought I was doing pretty good. A few people bragged on me, and I thought, man, I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm doing good. Brother Tip Jordan, a senior pastor that mentored me a lot, he said he uh, started out preaching, so they called him in several revivals. He said at that time he walked to church a lot, and we used to walk to church. Some in this house can remember this. And he said after a while, he said, man, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go the pomp way. He said, I put me on a suit. I dressed up real good. And I started walking to church. And I thought, man, they're in for a treat tonight. They get to hear me preach. He said, I had one last slope to go down before I got to the church. How many of you have ever tripped over a root after a rain? Uncle Tibbs said that uh, his toe hung in a root loop. He said, my nose plowed in the ground about that deep. And he said, I slid all the way down that hill with that suit on. He said, I got up and looked at how muddy I was. And, uh, and you know what happened? God changed the circumstance. The pump was over. You know, I thought one time, well, those few people bragged on me, and I went to a church, and I always said this, if God don't give it, I won't preach it. That's what I've always said. Went to church one night to preach, and I was feeling high on the mountain. I thought I can take any text in the Bible, and I can preach on it. Somebody going to like it, you know, and all that. And I got there, and you know what I had that night. Now, if any of y'all can't see that, I'm going to pay for your appointment. <laughs> you know what I had that night? I was as blank as this sheet of paper. I couldn't tell you my name, and I got up, and I said, if God don't send something, I'm not preaching. And the woman asked her, said, well, he really not preach if God don't give it. And she said, he will not preach tonight. <laughs> and guess what? I didn't. Because God showed me that in all the pomp and all the bragging and all the rain, the circumstance can change just like that. Naaman got healed because he listened to the man that listened to God. And that's what he was there for. That's what he was there for. Let me ask you something this morning. When things don't go right, God always will. God always will. And let me ask you, have you ever wondered why the word righteousness starts with the word right? When things don't go right, God will. And Naaman was sealed. Now, he could put on a spiritual festivity because God had answered that sermon pomp and circumstance. I said I was going to preach on the sermon I preached on before. I used the same title, but I didn't even touch on nothing I used before because God changed it while Michael was singing. But let me tell you something. As we get a song of invitation, our altar is open. And if you're watching today, the altar is open. And, you know, a lot of people ask them for prayer on that board back there, but the altar is open. If you feel like coming and praying for somebody that's on that to, on that prayer request, you can do that. But let me uh, tell you this. If, I, if you want to come and pray for yourself for any reason, uh, we're always open. I may not always say it, but we're always open. Let God use you. Naaman could have left, and he almost did. And he could have left and uh, been the same way he always was. How many people walk in the church and out of the church and in the church and out of the church and in the church and right on and on and never, ever change? 
You know, God wants us to pray for one another, forgive one another, and love one another. And you know, Naaman learned that day that he didn't have, I, how many times do you hear people say this, I don't have to do it God's way. I don't have to listen to God's word. But have you ever noticed how much better it goes? How much better it goes when we listen to God? Have you ever noticed that? The pomp was great when Naaman arrived, but he didn't count on the circumstance changing. It can change. What you see now, when it turns around, you won't see the same way. It's good to have a lot of you back this morning. I appreciate you. Thankful for you. Missed you. I told them the other night, I hope I don't over-exaggerate this, but it has been a rough, rough year. If you asked your dog about 2020, he'd say, rough. <laughs> it has been a rough year. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something about God. It's always got us in the hollow of his hand. Don't ever forget that as we stand for the invitation. We want to thank you all for being here today. We want to thank our folks that joined us uh, uh, by Facebook Live. We appreciate them as well. And I think, don't it feel good to be in church? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Feels good to be in church. And I praise the Lord for that. You know, I can attest to one thing through everything we've been through, through all of this. And I'm talking like it's about over. And I believe it is about over. But the thing that uh, I can attest to is the, the singing and the preaching spirit has never dwindled at all during all of this. I preached one night, had Finley and Jason upstairs and had Scotty uh, sitting about where Tom's at. And I was like the old farmer that dumped a whole load of hay on the cows. I just, it didn't bother me a bit. Because I knew that we were in that circumstance. When circumstances change, you need to identify it. And you need to pay attention to it. Naaman didn't, and he almost left the same way he came in. So pay attention. Uh, you know, 
A lot of us notice all the fanfare and the pomp, but we don't observe the circumstance. You may say, what do you mean circumstance? How does it affect me? Well, let me make it simple. If you've got four tires on your car and you go out and somebody stole one, don't try to make it to town. Circumstance can change, but God never does. Praise the Lord. Uh, Jason's going to take us off and uh, Facebook Live, and I'll make one. Uh